I am Dr. Alyssa Houston, and Dr. Ling and I are so excited to be able to spend this next hour um, speaking to you, talking about integrative oncology. This is something that we are both very uh, passionate about, that we've both been interested in for a number of years through both personal experiences, as well as from learning from our patients and wonderful questions from our patients. Um, so we're excited today to give a little overview about what is integrative oncology and what do we have here and how integrative oncology can help as uh, you're navigating the cancer treatment. So again, this is where our hope is to go over and demystify and talk about some of the the what is integrative oncology, how does it factor in with my treatment plan, what's involved, what's included, um, and what our services are here and how we use those services for our patients as they're going through their treatment course for cancer, whether that's with chemotherapy, radiation therapy, where they are on their cancer treatment journey, um, and what we have to be able to support our patients. So we like to start with what is integrative oncology? It's a patient-centered, evidence-informed field of cancer care that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products, and or lifestyle modifications from different traditions alongside conventional cancer treatments. It aims to optimize health, well-being, quality of life, and clinical outcomes across the cancer continuum and to empower people to prevent cancer and become active participants before, during, and beyond cancer treatment. It's to manage the symptoms of cancer and cancer treatment. We don't use it standalone and ever say it's to cure the cancer, but it's an adjunct to assist uh, alongside it. Again, it provides relationship-centered care. It integrates conventional and non-mainstream techniques, and it aims to activate the body's innate healing response, alter disease progression, enhance efficacy of treatment, relieve or prevent treatment side effects, essentially alter the terrain to be non-supportive to tumor cells and enhance that sense of control that we all would like to have. It uses natural, less invasive interventions when possible. Uh, we can look at what getting our terms straight is all about. A lot of people hear a lot of different words, but these are the usual ones they hear. Complementary means using a non-mainstream approach together with conventional medicine. Alternative is using a non-mainstream approach in place of conventional medicine. The either or. We don't do either or, we do together. And that's what integrative means. It's that weaving of non-mainstream techniques into conventional medicine to create a cohesive approach toward treating patients. The goals of integrative oncology are, again, to increase the patient's sense of control, decrease that ongoing inflammation, increase the body's innate immunity in the fight against cancer, and decrease stress. Always increasing hope, never false hope, but true real hope, and helping people make these plans together. So who are we here at the Pluta Integrative Oncology and Wellness Center? As you've already met uh, two of us, today. Um, myself and Dr. Ling are the co-medical directors. And then Sydney John, who welcomed everyone here, um, is our program manager and our coordinator and is a wonderful contact and wealth of resources when there are questions about programming, events, um, what is happening within our center. Beyond that, we're a larger family with our exercise physiologists, our yoga instructor, our massage therapists, our acupuncturists, our meditation provider, our nutritionist, our art therapists, and we'll talk a little more about each of these modalities as we go throughout this talk, um, but we all work together. Uh, our providers have additional oncology training, and they all work within our center to provide services and care to our patients. So why integrative oncology? Uh, and so research has shown that treatments such as acupuncture, yoga, meditation, exercise, massage, can all help in improving symptoms, uh, pain, fatigue, anxiety, depression, nausea, hot flashes. So we often talk about when we think about cancer treatments, the research and science that has gone behind developing those treatments. And there's similarly 
a lot of research and science that's gone behind showing how supportive modalities, integrative modalities can really help reduce symptoms and improve and enhance overall wellness. There are studies that show that healthy diet, exercise, maintaining a normal weight can improve survival after a cancer diagnosis, and that exercise and weight loss can improve symptoms and quality of life in cancer patients. Doing wellness-related activities, increasing physical activity, eating well, feeding our bodies with healthy, good, nutritious foods, all of those can help overall in reducing cancer risk and improving wellness. Other positives, uh, integrative oncology modalities provide a sense of that control at a time when most patients feel a distinct loss of control. And that can be very powerful to get back some control. Uh, therapies uh, reduce patients' stress and anxiety and improve their physical, mental, and emotional well-being during and after treatment. Because these are part of the goals. We want to partner with the patients and help them along their treatment journey, but also well beyond in true survivorship. Patients do report feeling like they are actively doing something to be healthy, and this engages their partners and caregivers as well. So in looking at the development of integrative oncology and the use of specific integrative oncology modalities. This was from uh, the National Society, really international society that we are both a part of, um, called the Society for Integrative Oncology. And this was at their national conference several years ago. But we wanted to include this to show how specific modalities have really grown in their use at large cancer centers. So these National Cancer Institute designated cancer centers that we think about across the country, um, that there has been this increased growth and inclusion with the recognition that supportive modalities, integrative modalities can really help patients as they're going throughout their treatment course. Along with that, when we look at national guidelines and how we help with managing cancer-related symptoms, so cancer-related fatigue, nausea, uh, supportive modalities that fall under the umbrella of palliative care, which could be include things like pain management, specific pain management, survivorship, so how we include wellness and what we do after you finished your active treatment, and also distress. Everyone, especially during the pandemic, has had increased stress and distress, and cancer adds to that. And that's something else that, that integrative modalities are really woven into all of these guidelines, including physical activity, yoga, massage therapy for helping with cancer-related fatigue, uh, modalities such as acupuncture or acupressure for helping with nausea, that anticipation of nausea. So these have now made their way from the science, the research into the guideline recommendations that we look to as we treat our patients. So uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which is another large organization, um, had partnered with our Society for Integrative Oncology. And actually, this is specific to breast cancer patients, but the societies are actually working on additional um, recommendations and guidelines to use for pain, fatigue, anxiety, and depression, but really looking again at, at partnering with the Integrative Oncology Society and our oncology societies to create guidelines for how we can better care for our patients and how we can use and recommend things like yoga, meditation, physical activity based upon the research and studies that have been done. I want to point out that actually um, a few providers here are local to our own institution. So Dr. Karen Mushjian and her name will come up later when we talk about our movement modalities and some of the programs we have here. But we're part of developing these important tools that we can use to help give the best recommendations to our patients. Uh, these are the modalities that we have at our center. Uh, and I love the icons or symbols that were created with the Wilmot Cancer Institute, University of Rochester people. Uh, we can see the four pillars, if you will, movement, touch, nutrition, and mindfulness. 
And within each of those modalities or categories, uh, it's, there are different ways of assess, you know, assisting with this. Uh, evidence suggests that physical activity is effective in relieving some of the symptoms of cancer treatment, such as the fatigue and the sleep-related problem, problems. Regular exercise is also shown to decrease the risk of certain cancers and extend survival. Touch, again, evidence, because that's what we base everything on. It's all evidence-based suggests that healing touch, such as massage therapy and acupuncture, is helpful in decreasing all the symptoms and side effects that Alyssa was alluding to and mentioning. Uh, acupuncture can help patients with chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, as well as sleep issues. Nutrition, we'll talk more about that later, but healthy eating habits, specialized diets, and I can't overemphasize how well qualified our oncology specially trained staff are at our center. Mindfulness, evidence shows that the use of mind-body techniques such as meditation, yoga, and qigong are other creative means tapping into that power of the brain uh, of expression can help diminish anxiety, stress, pain, and fatigue. So movement, uh, as I mentioned, evidence suggests that physical activity is effective in relieving some of the symptoms of cancer treatment. And fatigue is, is quite big for most of our patients, if not all to some degree and the associated sleep-related problems. Meanwhile, regular exercise is also shown to decrease the risk of certain cancers and again, extend survival. This uh, shows some of the uh, recommendations based also on the evidence that has been garnered by many studies. And our team at the University of Rochester has been a main contributor to many of those. Uh, the 2020 American Cancer Society Guideline on Diet and Physical Activity achieve and maintain a healthy body weight throughout life. And what we encourage people to do is not to continue to gain weight. And then what are tools that can help them figure out what is their best set point? Keep body within that healthy range for them. Be physically active. And what does that mean? So that's why we like to call it movement because uh, exercise is a word some people don't really like to hear so much, but it is true physical activity and some kind of movement. And there are so many different ways of doing movement. Uh, this is uh, in October, 2019, three papers were published following an international multidisciplinary round table hosted by the American College of Sports Medicine. One of those papers was a consensus statement and listed specific exercise recommendations for cancer patients and survivors. Uh, for breast cancer, similar large long-term studies showed that women who engage in moderate to vigorous exercise for more than three hours per week have a 30% to 40% lower risk of breast cancer. This applies to all women, regardless of family history or risk of breast cancer. And we can see what is the strong evidence on the top of this slide and what is moderate evidence. However, uh, exercise, which is appropriate for that individual, and we have these very specialized uh, physiologists who work with the patients, uh, can really uh, help and won't harm people, which is why I'd like to introduce, uh, if you haven't already heard about it, our Renew program, which is a, a wonderful offering uh, for our patients. It's to recharge, revive, relax, because that balance that we're trying to strive for nutrition, exercise, and wellness program for cancer survivors. And that is during their cancer treatment journey too. So once one, one has the diagnosis, it's for all the patients who walk through our institute if they are interested. It's symptom-focused, evidence-based wellness program, including comprehensive individualized exercise testing, meeting one-on-one -on -one with that oncology-trained exercise physiologist in the kindest of ways, evidence-based exercise consultation, meeting with that person where they are coming from, what can they do? And it's all supervised and they feel, okay, I have my own personal coach, if you will, or trainer. So cancer-related fatigue can be a very significant uh, symptom that patients undergoing cancer, both cancer treatment, as well as cancer survivors can face nearly two times what the average population experiences, and this can be identified in over two thirds of cancer survivors. 40% of those reporting cancer related fatigue have noted that it's severe and it can last for many months following treatment. Moderate and light exercise during and following cancer treatment can result in a significant reduction in fatigue levels. And 
Um, again, a lot of this work has been done here at the University of Rochester. So this again is Dr. Karen Mushkin's work. And what this shows, what this graph really shows is that this was a combination of a lot of different research studies. As we've said throughout the talk, we look at the evidence, we look at what's been done and, and look at how does exercise um, compare to other things that we might think about for fatigue. So pharmaceutical or medications, um, psychological interventions, exercise and exercise plus psychological interventions. So what this is, is it was a combination of over a hundred plus different studies looking at exercise, you know, during and after primary treatment for cancer to really look at cancer related fatigue and how exercise compared to other things that might be done. And when you look at this graph, what we're looking at is over here more favorable. So the, the shapes that have a bigger size and are further on this side of the graph that shows that those offer a better benefit that's more favorable. There's more weight to those interventions. And you can see that exercise has the largest square and really outperforms the other things that we might think about. So again, showing how exercise can really help uh, as a, a way of improving cancer-related fatigue. So I wanted to now move to one of our, our second pillars, the touch pillar. And that includes two of our modalities, acupuncture as well as massage. I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about acupuncture. Many, many of you are, are very familiar with massage or the concept of massage, but what is acupuncture? How does acupuncture work? So acupuncture is based on tr the traditional Chinese medicine theory that the human body is connected by energy pathways called meridians. Um, and this energy is often called qi. And these pathways can be accessed through the use of very tiny solid stainless steel needles, often the size of just a very small human hair that are inserted into specific points or meridians um, along the body. And that activates or serves to activate the theory is the body's natural potential to treat or heal the condition. And these meridians over the course of time have been standardized. And so our acupuncturists can communicate and know which ones, which points are being used and which points may help with specific symptoms. So these are just pictures of what those might look like, just to give you a sense of what our acupuncturists are, are referencing as they think about where would be the best place to provide those acupuncture needles. So there's been a lot of growing research about the use of acupuncture, as well as massage or healing touch, as we call it. And that, that both of these modalities can help reduce anxiety, help improve or reduce nausea and vomiting symptoms. Healing touch can also improve relaxation and mood. So when we talked about some of those research guidelines earlier, these recommendations are part of that, that massage and acupuncture can really help in alleviating those symptoms. We know that acupuncture can help with improving some of the numbness and tingling that can result from the use of specific chemotherapy medications. That's often referred to as neuropathy and many patients can experience that as they go throughout the course of their treatment. And just like we have research studies that compare one medicine to another medicine for the treatment of cancer, we now have research that tells us that compares acupuncture and usual care or even um, you know, simulated acupuncture that shows that acupuncture can help in reducing those symptoms. Additionally, similar research has shown us that acupuncture can help improve some of the joint aches that many patients specifically with breast cancer experience when they're taking anti-estrogen based medications, as well as that acupuncture can help in alleviating hot flashes. So really providing broad um, uh, relief of a variety of different symptoms by the use of acupuncture. Uh, I'd like to uh, move forward on now with our one of our other wonderful pillars and uh, just mention, and we'll mention this later, that all of these uh, modalities are free of charge to our patients. And it's all because of the wonderful uh, philanthropy and support of the Pluta Foundation. 
So we're blessed in this community to have this precious, wonderful resource. Well, we are what we eat, aren't we? <laughs> so nutrition is a definite pillar of what we offer. And we have these wonderfully trained nutritionists, uh, dietitians who provide consultations, meeting one-on-one, -on -one, listening to the patient first. What are they doing? What can they do with no judgment and offering appropriate consultations for what could benefit them? Uh, we have these cooking for wellness classes, which are fantastic. They used to be in person, now they're virtual. Uh, hopefully uh, we can go back to the in-person classes in the not too distant future where the patient participants can actually participate in the classes and uh, really uh, with all their senses understand what is going on there and including tasting afterwards. Uh, we have many signature events, including chef demos, cooking basics, knife skills, plan your way to a cancer fighting diet, healthy foods to increase calories, the good calories and protein and nutrition during chemotherapy, welcoming patients and their caregivers feedback as to what would be helpful for them as we continue to design our offerings. Uh, there's a whole new, newer arena of culinary medicine that is being explored because uh, as we know, Hippocrates said in 400 BC, let thy food be thy medicine and thy medicine be thy food because that can be one of the most potent building blocks for what we put into our bodies and how we respond to treatments and also to how our well-being is. Uh, I used to say, don't eat something that your great-great-grandmother would not recognize because it's the modern era of foods that are highly processed, that are unfriendly in general to the body. And I also would tell people, gee, uh, what are you feeding your growing child? Would you feed them what you're feeding yourself and how you're eating it as you are right now. Most people would say, no way, Jose. <laughs> but this is where we kindly coach and support and partner with our patients as they're going through what they are going through. I'd like to point out that, as I said, we have uh, a rotating uh, number of uh, classes for our patients. These are two that are coming up and there's quite the variety and uh, knife skills because honestly, uh, the diets that we encourage people to consider are plant forward, and that does require a lot more knife skills. And it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun in my own personal opinion, but let's do it safely. So the next one of those is Tuesday, February 8th, and that's been asked to be repeated again, so it's been helpful. And then one example of our cooking for wellness demonstrations coming up February 17th is one pan dishes. We want to make it practical and easy and delicious and also not expensive for our patients. So we understand about prep and cleanup. Uh, Joanna Lith is one of our wonderful registered dietitians, and she'll do the featured recipes, as you can see there. Research shows that healthy eating habits and specialized diets can reduce side effects of cancer treatment. A diet focusing on whole plants has been shown to improve health and reduce risk of several cancer. And we try to assist the patients to recognize what the overall pattern of their diet is, rather than specifically the individual foods. Yes, individual foods are important, but it's the pattern. Why is that? Because especially with plant-forward diets, dietary phytochemicals are so named because they are found exclusively in plant foods and are key because of their anti-inflammatory and antioxidant capacity. So consumption of a wide variety of whole plant-based foods should be emphasized and reliance on single ingredient extracts or supplements discouraged because we have people often come in with a whole uh, suitcase full of supplements and we talk to them about it, but it's through the whole plant-based or uh, overall nutritionally sound regular food diet that is best absorbed by the body and utilized. Uh, diverse phytochemicals act synergistically within the body. Uh, these phytochemicals can be identified because they're brightly colored. Therefore, a rainbow of colors from vegetables and fruits can be used as a surrogate marker for adequate variety in the diet. At the same time, there are some compelling data on individual foods and breast cancer risk reduction. Despite the fact that some studies have concluded that foods confer no protective benefit, it is important to interpret the studies showing protection in light of understanding the levels of evidence required to make a recommendation. 
So according to the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, medical recommendations should be based on weighted consideration of possible net benefits overall and harms of a particular intervention. So we look at this very carefully. Following those guidelines, if evidence shows that a food may reduce breast cancer risk and the food itself has minimal potential for harm, then we should be recommending that food. Uh, nutrition, here we can see cancer risk reduction pre and post diagnosis. Uh, again, uh, we, I specialize in breast cancer, but we're looking at all cancers actually. Dietary patterns rich in plant foods and low in animal products and refined carbohydrates lower the risk. And the Mediterranean diet pattern lowers risk. Consumption of non-starchy vegetables and our vegetables rich in carotenoids may lower risk for estrogen receptor negative breast tumors. And diets higher in calcium, calcium rich dairy may reduce risk. There are other sources of calcium that we can talk to patients about as well. Meanwhile, alcohol consumption may increase risk of premenopausal breast cancer and increase risk of postmenopausal breast cancer. So we really sort all the risks benefits net with the patients. And we don't tell people to deprive themselves, but we do certainly emphasize how they're eating and the quality of what they're putting into their bodies. Here we see the 2020 American Cancer Society guideline on diet and physical activity for cancer prevention. Uh, people know this, but we like to gently, kindly uh, encourage this again and again. Pretty much if you put in uh, more of the desirable foods and uh, beverages, water is great, of course, too, uh, it crowds out the less desirable things. And people find, oh, I'm less inclined to do that uh, less desired or not desired thing if I'm putting in all these wonderful nutrients. And wow, I'm tapping into feeling in, how do I feel after I eat this very uh, healthy, fun, tasty diet? compared to when I overindulge in something not as uh, good for my body. So the eating patterns, the foods, the variety of vegetables and colors, whole grains, limiting processed meats and sugar sweetened beverages, highly processed foods, and best not to drink alcohol or to drink it in a sensible manner and to really engage the community around them. And a lot of patients of ours say that their family starts to eat better and feel better also moving forward. Here we see a study uh, that shows again how uh, adherence to a Mediterranean diet uh, reduces the risk of cancer. This was an updated systematic review and meta-analysis of many, many studies published in 2017. And essentially everything to the left shows what is beneficial and anything to the right increases risk of cancer occurrence or recurrence. So based on this, one should uh, really strive for whole vegetables, fruit and whole grain products at every meal and uh, liberal use of excellent uh, extra virgin olive oil, uh, regular and even moderate consumption of red wine because that's what they do in the Mediterranean and physical activity and social component. Uh, people with the highest adherence to the Mediterranean diet may have a 14% lower risk of cancer mortality or dying of cancer, which is very powerful. So now I'd like to shift to our fourth pillar in our Integrative Oncology Center, which is mindfulness. And mindfulness, again, by definition, is a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment while calmly acknowledging and accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations used as a therapeutic technique. We know that around us, there's so many distractions. There's our busy lifestyles and then adding in going through cancer treatment and the concerns around that and the added appointments and stress and different ways of communicating. And um, there's just a lot that, that goes on around us. And so finding these moments of mindfulness where you can focus your awareness, clear your mind, um, can really have significant and beneficial impacts on overall quality of life, as well as on specific symptoms. So again, looking to what research has been done, what information is out on studying the use of mindfulness techniques, um, meditation has been shown to have what we would say is grade A or higher levels of evidence 
to help in addressing anxiety and depression, um, as well as also in mood disturbance and depressive symptoms, as well as for improving overall quality of life. Music therapy, we know how music can um, calm many patients, um, can calm us when you're in the middle of a busy day or you're driving home and you need time to relax and think. Music can be very beneficial in that circumstance. And there have been a lot of studies about music and the use of music therapy in reducing anxiety during cancer treatments, as well as during procedures. Progressive muscle relaxation and guided imagery, which is another form of a, a mindfulness um, intervention. And that's been also shown to help with mood disturbance and depressive symptoms. And there's even research that shows that that can help with hot flashes. So a mindfulness technique that helps relieve and reduce symptoms that doesn't involve taking another medication, um, taking another pill when, when most of our patients going through treatment are already taking a lot of other medicines to help with their symptoms. So ways of really helping to improve symptoms, improve overall quality of life, improve mood, that's something that one can do even just sitting, waiting in an office, waiting for their provider to come in. There's um, a number of electronic-based applications um, that are available, that uh, Headspace, Calm, there's a variety of them that can easily be downloaded. And um, a simple meditation if you're waiting to undergo a scan or if you're waiting, getting treatment can really be helpful. So we have here in our center meditation classes. We have a oncology certified meditation provider and she offers classes as well as we'll, we'll uh, meet with patients one-on-one -on -one and provide an individual meditation um, uh, overview. And that can be very helpful, especially if you're new to meditation. We have art therapy both open and group classes, and that's another form. It falls under our mindfulness umbrella. We have Qigong and Tai Chi. Both of those are our classes that involve both a movement and mindfulness component. And then yoga, which can fall under both our movement modality, but as well, it also incorporates a mindfulness piece in our, our Expert oncology certified yoga instructor offers classes both in person as well as virtually via Zoom for patients and their caregivers so that it can be something that you can engage in together if you're supporting your, your significant other that's going through cancer treatment. So again, just to highlight some of the additional um, offerings that we have here in our center. We have, this is our art therapist. Um, and so just to really highlight some of the art classes that we have here. So an open studio, which is a place where patients can come and explore different creative arts ways and outlets of connecting with others and helping to express themselves, um, as well as a mindfulness art studio. Um, again, welcoming patients in to enhance really their emotional well-being, to really help support and guide patients as they go through using creative arts, using art as a way of providing that, as well as Zoom art classes. If you live a distance or not able to come in, we also have Zoom offerings as well. And just to highlight another uh, important offering that we have here. This is our oncology certified yoga instructor, Susan Wood. And again, a upcoming session on Wednesday, February 23rd, a virtual presentation on yoga bites for morning, noon, and night. Um, so a workshop that she will be leading um, to just provide fresh new ways of practicing and incorporating yoga into daily life. It can be small amounts throughout the day, um, moments even when you're seated or in between um, different elements of your day that you can incorporate yoga into what you're doing to help provide a more centered and relaxed feel. And sleep. Um, sleep really also is another uh, can be very challenging to patients as they go through treatment. We know how important sleep is for all of us, and especially if you're going through cancer treatment. Um, and so we know that the rate of insomnia in cancer patients is also quite high. It's nearly twice that what we see in the general population. 
And there's mindfulness-based techniques such as cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which can really help in improving overall sleep, the components of sleep, um, stimulus control, kind of resetting your mind about establishing a regular sleep pattern, helping to improve kind of those nighttime behaviors, what's happening as you, as you kind of prepare for sleep. Um, but this is another element of mindfulness that can really help in alleviating and helping to improve sleep. We all know how we feel better after a wonderful and full night of sleep. Uh, this is to highlight our monthly calendar that comes out. So February is uh, just around the corner. We can see our icons for our mindfulness movement, touch and nutrition, and uh, how it's color coded, which to me, I'm a visual person, is super helpful. And then which classes are in person? I can just see the green pop out at me and which are in Zoom. And now we're very glad to offer hybrid. We see that lovely blue color there, uh, classes where participants may join the class in person or via Zoom. We want to offer this to be as flexible as possible for people to meet them from where they are coming out on a given day. All programs require registration and we want to know and hear from the patients and their caregivers what works for them, what doesn't work for them, and how can we continue to advance this process for them? Uh, at the Pluto Integrative Oncology and Wellness Center, uh, we are an active partner in a patient's comprehensive cancer care. I keep using the word partnering because that is what it is. It's not we're telling you what to do. Uh, meanwhile, I, as a physician, I can say I, I tell people what we have to do, but this is to what can we do together to help you be as well as possible through this process and beyond. Our programs and services are designed to help patients manage the symptoms of cancer and cancer treatment and to improve their quality of life. All programs, as I said, are free of charge to our patients. This is a very unique model that no other place has and we're so blessed by the Pluto Foundation and our lovely community because of this. And all group classes are also open to care partners uh, I sneakily went into one of these meditation classes one day, and uh, the group that was there I knew didn't know who I was, which was great. <laughs> and I, uh, I saw a, a dyad of the patient and her partner there. Uh, they didn't have breast cancer history, but to see what went on in that room was so astonishing to me with our wonderful meditation uh, provider there. And such that uh, at the end, uh, one of my patients, uh, this is a separate thing, said, I, I did that meditation thing. And she said, Marilyn, I felt like I took a vacation from myself. And I've used this, uh, borrowed it from her uh, a number of times because that is how sometimes the power of uh, what you can do with your mind to really just take a break from it all and to feel in a safe environment provided uh, can be very helpful and certainly is not harmful. And everything is evidence-based and symptom-directed. So who is eligible for which of our services? So patients can call and self-refer for any of our group programs, patients and caregivers. And as we showed you on the calendar, there's our phone number and um, just call in advance and register, whether it's in person or if it's by Zoom, then you'd receive the Zoom link in anticipation of the class. Provider referrals are required for some of our specifics. So our two touch modalities, acupuncture and massage. Um, and Again, as we've highlighted a few times, this is all free and available and supported by our incredibly generous Pluto Foundation. And because of that, it's a precious resource. And because these are individual modalities, they are more limited in what we can offer. We would love someday to have everything available to everyone. But because these are precious, we wanna make good, good utilization of this precious resource. For acupuncture and massage, those are reserved for our patients who are receiving active chemotherapy, who are receiving active radiation therapy, or have an advanced or metastatic 
diagnosis of their cancer. Um, and they can receive one of those during that treatment part of their course of therapy. Um, and if there's questions about that, that's where Sydney can offer input and we are always available to look at and review um, what would be best for that for, for our patient. And then there's also integrative oncology consults where we will meet with a patient and help again review more specifically after an intake evaluation um, that has certain specific questions that really help guide us in making the, the, the best recommendations, the ideal recommendations for which modality would help based upon the individual's goals, objectives, what they're hoping to gain from participation in our center, as well as what symptoms may be um, currently going on and how a specific modality might be best uh, recommended at, and at which time that modality may be best recommended. Maybe exercise when treatment's done, but not right now, but a nutrition consult might benefit someone better as they're embarking on chemotherapy. So we can really provide those nuanced guidelines and, and input. Additionally, and during the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were looking at, well, how can we keep offering these resources, these, this wonderful uh, opportunities to our patients, even when at one point we weren't able to have patients coming into our center here. Um, and also recognizing that some patients drive a distance for their cancer care. So coming in for extra visits or extra classes may be something that they're just not able to do or because of COVID concerns in their treatment, there may be concerns about exposures. Um, so we created a virtual integrative oncology center um, to provide as many of our resources as we can um, online and available to patients to be able to access from home, wherever that may be. And this is a link here, and that link we can provide, um, and that takes us right to our virtual center. And if there's time, we can even screen share later and show that. Um, and then we've also created cards that have a little QR code, and many of you may be familiar with that. And you can then access and go straight to the virtual center and our resources right from your phone. And this is just a list of what we call our video menu or video library of our four core pillars. Um, we have movement, we have nutrition, we have touch and mindfulness. And within each one, there's videos that have been created and developed under each category um, that you can access and they can provide a wealth of resources. Under the touch, there's wonderful um, acupressure uh, so this is the idea of using uh, those acupuncture points, as I, I showed you earlier when we talked about acupuncture, but actually applying your own pressure from your own uh, hands or fingers um, to those points to help relieve symptoms. And these, are, these can help provide, I've participated in them as well, and they can really provide a sense of relaxation and improvement. And I've heard wonderful feedback from patients incorporating that. There's as well meditation videos, so you can practice meditation at, at home. Um, so this is really available for patients to be able to access anywhere at any time. And then the other thing that is part of our umbrella here is not only thinking about helping to manage symptoms during the course of treatment and beyond once someone's finished with their active treatment, but also thinking about how do we help patients when they're diagnosed, helping to maintain them to be the best that they can be throughout that treatment and um, this whole concept of prehab. So many people are familiar with rehab, rehabilitation that helps you become stronger after you've finished with say maybe a surgery or even at the end of um, some other type of either treatment or intervention. But prehab really starts at the time of diagnosis. And it helps identify with our exercise physiologist and nutritionist where someone's coming in, what level of activity, where's their nutritional status, and how we can create specific uh, guidelines and recommendations to help them as they're going through their treatment. So then at the end of it, they some feel even better if they've been able to engage in an exercise regimen 
make some nutrition or dietary recommendations. Um, and so this is really uh, patient specific and guided by our exercise physiologist and our nutritionist. But that's another program that we've just recently begun and we're excited to see that keep growing. Uh, who will benefit from integrative oncology? Patients with symptoms not being well-managed medically, fatigue, anxiety, sleep, hot flashes, and a variety of others, but with safe modalities that uh, people can do in the safety of their own home if they like to. Patients looking to increase quality of life, whatever that means for them, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, Newly diagnosed patients looking for a way to maintain a sense of normalcy to their life. Patients who are seeking control over the parts of their life that they have control over. What can I do? I know what I can't do at this moment in time, but what, what can I do? That would be a great building block for me. Uh, we truly thank you for all of your kind attention. And if there are any questions, we certainly welcome them. <laughs>